continuing our discussions of the nervous system, we're now moving into the peripheral nervous system in Chapter 13. In Chapter 13, we are going to be looking at sensory receptors, peripheral nerves, and all the associated ganglia, as well as motor endings. Just to make this more in context with what we've been learning in our class, let's flip back real quickly to this picture or this figure from Chapter 11. Remember in Chapter 12, we went over the central nervous system, which included just the brain and the spinal cord. Now we're looking at the peripheral nervous system. In this chapter, we will look at both the sensory division and the motor division. The sensory division is the portion of the peripheral nervous system that brings sensory information from various sensory receptors within the body to the central nervous system. The motor division is going to be composed of motor nerve fibers and the motor nerve endings that are associated with muscles and glands. The direction in which our nerve impulses are going to travel with our motor division are going to be from the central nervous system out to muscles. One thing that we will not discuss in this chapter is the specific part of the motor division that makes up our autonomic nervous system. That is chapter 14. So now let's move on into chapter 13 and begin thinking more about the peripheral nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, one of the major things we need to discuss are our sensory receptors. And let's understand how the pathway of information flows. We are first going to begin on the receptor level where our sensory receptors will be located. Once the sensory receptor is activated due to some sort of change in its environment, that is going to activate the receptor, causing a graded potential and eventually an action potential to move through nerves into the central nervous system. Once the sensory information travels through the spinal cord, it then moves through the reticular formation into the thalamus and eventually up to the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe of the, cerebral, the cerebrum. What we are really focusing on in this chapter is what's occurring here at the receptor level and the path of this receptor, this sensory signal to the spinal cord the actual sensation and perception of the stimulus, truly understanding what the stimulus means, that is not what we are discussing. That happens in the spinal cord and the brain itself. The first part of the chapter focuses on how we classify different receptors in our body. One way to classify sensory receptors is classifying them by the type of stimulus that activates the receptor. We in our body have mechanoreceptors. These are going to be sensory receptors that respond to touch, pressure, vibration, stretch, and itch. Just to use the touch receptor as an example, you have various touch receptors on your skin close to the surface. When something touches your skin that mechanically presses on the ends of the sensory receptors which are attached to nerves. Once the pressure or the touch activates that receptor, that begins graded potentials and eventually action potentials that will send the impulse through your sensory neuron, excuse me, through your sensory nerves towards your spinal cord. In our body, we also have thermoreceptors that are sensitive to changes in temperature. These are also found throughout our body. We have photoreceptors that respond to light energy. They are only found on the retina. We have chemoreceptors that respond to chemicals. We have chemoreceptors in the nasal cavity, in the taste buds, which are part of in the oral cavity down deep in your tongue, and also in various places in our body where we're monitoring the different levels of chemicals in our blood. The last type of receptor that we can categorize by the type of stimulus is called a nociceptor. These are going to be pain receptors. They are sensitive to various things, but they are sensitive at different levels. 
That is why we can feel different levels of pain. We can also classify our receptors not by the type of stimulus, but by their location in the body. Exteroceptors are going to respond to a stimulus arising outside of our body. We may have mechanoreceptors, nociceptors, and thermoreceptors that are classified as exteroceptors. Simply means they are close to the outside of the body and responding to that sort of stimulus. We have enteroceptors, which are going to respond to some sort of stimulus on the inside of the body. Again, we can have mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, chemoreceptors, various types of receptors. They're just going to be on the places inside of our body. The last location receptor we have is a proprioceptor. This is going to be a receptor that responds to stretch, such as stretch in skeletal muscles, tendons, joints, ligaments, and bone and muscle coverings. This allows us to have a better idea of our orientation in space and the actual orientation of our body. Sensory receptors are known for their ability to adapt. Adaptation is the receptor's ability to change in sensitivity if a stimulus is kept constant. What will happen is if you keep that sensory receptor activated for too long, that receptor can become less responsive. You get less and less of those graded potentials until you eventually no longer get an action potential originating in that sensory receptor. There are fast adapting receptors that allow us to allow us to have a signal of the beginning and the end of the stimulus. And then we also have tonic receptors, which adapt very slowly or not at all. If you think about this, which receptors do you think are most likely to adapt? Things like pressure, touch, smell, those aren't quite as essential. Have you ever walked into a room that smelt bad and you thought, oh gosh, this smells horrible? And then a few minutes later, you didn't smell it anymore. Did the chemical that was activating your chemoreceptors in your nose go away? No, you just got used to it. You didn't let it bother you anymore. Now, something like a pain receptor, it's not going to adapt as fast because if it is sensing pain, that pain could signal potential damage to our body, so we need that to go away not as easily. We need to know that that pain is there.